Good afternoon. My name is Shelley Guten, and it's a pleasure to be back uh, as part of the Residence Reading Program. Today I'm going to read from a book by Bill Bryson entitled The Body, A Guide to Occupants, which happened to be all of us. And I'm going to start with part of chapter two, Skin and Hair. First he has a quote from Dorothy Parker. Beauty is only skin deep, but ugly goes clean to the bone. It may be slightly surprising to think it, but our skin is our largest organ and possibly the most versatile. It keeps our insides in and bad things out. It cushions blows. It gives us our sense of touch, bringing us pleasure and warmth and pain and nearly everything else that makes us vital. It produces melanin to shield us from the sun's rays. It repairs itself when we abuse it. It accounts for such beauty as we can muster. It looks after us. The formal name for the skin is the cutaneous system. Its size is about two square meters, approximately 20 square feet. And all told, your skin will weigh something in the region of 10 to 15 pounds. Though much depends naturally on how tall you are and how much buttock and belly it needs to stretch across. It is thinnest on the eyelids, about one thousandth of an inch thick, and thickest on the heels of our hands and feet. Unlike a heart or kidney, skin never fails. Our seams don't burst. We don't spontaneously sprout leaks. The skin consists of an inner layer called the dermis and an outer epidermis. I don't know if uh, in your schoolyard kids would run up to you and say, your epidermis is showing. And of course, we were supposed to be appalled, but we eventually found out that, yes, everybody's epidermis is showing. The outermost surface of the epidermis, called the stratum corneum, is made up entirely of dead cells. It's an arresting thought that all that makes you lovely is deceased. Where body meets air, we are all cadavers. These outer skin cells are replaced every month. We shed copiously, almost carelessly, some 25,000 flakes a minute, over a million pieces every hour. Run a finger along a dusty shelf, and you are, in large part, clearing a path through fragments of your former self. Silently and remorselessly, we turn to dust. Skin flakes are properly called squamae, meaning scales. We each trail behind us about a pound of dust every year. If you burn the contents of a vacuum cleaner bag, the predominant odor is that unmistakable scorched smell that we associate it with burning hair. That's because skin and hair are made largely of the same stuff, keratin. Beneath the epidermis is the more fertile dermis, where reside all the skin's active systems, blood and lymph vessels, nerve fibers, the roots of hair follicles, the glandular reservoirs of sweat and sebum. Beneath that, and not technically part of the skin, is a subcutaneous layer where fat is stored. Though it may not be part of the cutaneous system, it's an important part of your body because it stores energy, provides insulation, and attaches the skin to the body beneath. 
Nobody knows for sure how many holes you have in your skin, but you are pretty seriously perforated. Most estimates suggest you have somewhere in the region of two to five million hair follicles and perhaps twice that number of sweat glands. The follicles do double duty. They sprout hairs and secrete sebum from sebaceous glands, <clears throat> which mixes with sweat to form an oily layer on the surface. This helps to keep skin supple and to make it inhospitable for many foreign organisms. Sometimes the pores become blocked with little plugs of dead skin and dried sebum in what is known as a blackhead. If the follicle additionally becomes infected and inflamed, the result is the adolescent dread known as a pimple. Pimples plague young people simply because their sebaceous glands, like all their glands, are highly active. When the condition becomes chronic, the result is acne. Also packed into the dermis are a variety of receptors that keep us literally in touch with the world. If a breeze plays lightly on your cheek, it is your Meissner's corpuscles that let you know. When you put your hand on a hot plate, your Ruffini corpuscles cry out. Merkel cells respond to constant pressure. Piscinian corpuscles to vibration. Meissner's corpuscles are everyone's favorites. They detect light touch and are particularly abundant in our erogenous zones and other areas of heightened sensitivity. Fingertips, lips, tongue, clitoris, penis, and so on. They are named after a German anatomist George Meissner, who is credited with discovering them in 1852, though his colleague Rudolf Wagner claimed that he was the discoverer. The two men fell out over the matter, proving that there is no detail in science too small for animosity. All are exquisitely fine-tuned to let you feel the world. A Piscinian corpuscle can detect a movement as slight as, now listen, 0 0.0001 millimeter, which is practically no movement at all. More than this, they don't even require contact with the material they are interpreting. As David Linden points out in his book, Touch, if you sink a spade into gravel, or into sand, you can feel the difference between them even though all you are touching is the spade. Curiously, we don't have any receptors for wetness. We have only thermal sensors to guide us, which is why when you sit down on a wet spot, you can't generally tell whether it is really wet or just cold. One of the most memorably unexpected events I experienced in the course of doing this book came in a dissection room at the University of Nottingham in England, when a professor and surgeon named Oliveri gently incised and peeled back a sliver of skin about a millimeter thick from the arm of a cadaver. It was so thin as to be translucent. This, he said, is where all your skin color is. That's all that race is, a sliver of epidermis. Skin color turned out to be more scientifically complicated than anyone imagined. Over 120 genes are responsible in pigmentation in mammals so it is really hard to unpack it all. What we can say is this. Skin gets its color from a variety of pigments of which 
the most important by far is a, mole a molecule called melanin. It is one of the oldest molecules in biology, and it is found throughout the living world. It doesn't just color skin. It gives birds the color of their feathers, fish the texture and luminescence of their scales, squid the purpley ink of their, I'm sorry, the purpley blackness of their ink. It's even involved in making fruits go brown. In us, it also colors our hair. Its production slows dramatically as we age, which is why older people's hair tends to turn gray. Melanin is a superb natural sunscreen. It is produced in cells called melanocytes. All of us, whatever our race, have the same number of melanocytes. The difference is in the amount of melanin produced. Melanin often responds to sunlight in literally patchy ways, resulting in freckles. It has been suggested that light skin may be a consequence of human migration and the rise of agriculture. The argument is that hunter-gatherers got a lot of their vitamin D from fish and game, and that these inputs fell sharply when people started growing crops. <clears throat> Excuse me. especially as they moved into northern latitudes. It therefore became a great advantage to have lighter skin, to synthesize extra vitamin D. Vitamin D is vital to health. It helps build strong bones and teeth, boosts the immune system, fights cancers, and nourishes the heart. It is thoroughly good stuff. We can get it in two ways, from the foods we eat or through sunlight. The problem is that too much UV exposure damages DNA in our cells and can cause skin cancer. Getting the right amount is a tricky balance. At all events, the slow evolution of different skin tones worked fine when people stayed in one place or migrated slowly. But nowadays, increased mobility means that lots of people end up in places where sun levels and skin tones don't get along at all. In regions like Northern Europe and Canada, it isn't possible in the winter months to extract enough vitamin D from weakened sunlight to maintain health, no matter how pale one's skin is. So vitamin D must be consumed as food, and hardly anyone gets enough, and not surprisingly. To meet dietary requirements from food alone, you would have to eat 15 eggs or six pounds of Swiss cheese every day. Or, more plausibly, if not more palatably, swallow half a, teaspoon, half a tablespoon of cod liver oil. Cod liver oil, this is not Bill Bryson, this is me. Cod liver oil almost ruined my childhood. Thank goodness there were so many other good things in my childhood. Um, but I really thought my parents were trying to poison me. In America, milk is helpfully supplemented with vitamin D but that still provides only a third of the daily requirements for adults. In consequence, some 50% of people globally are estimated to be vitamin D deficient for at least part of the year. In northern climates, it may be as much as 90%. As people evolved lighter skin, they also developed lighter colored eyes and hair, but only pre pretty recently. Lighter colored eyes and hair evolved somewhere around the Baltic Sea about 6,000 years ago. 
it's not obvious why. Hair and eye color don't affect vitamin D metabolism or anything else physiological come to that. So there seems to be no practical benefit. The supposition is that these traits were selected uh, as tribal markers or because people found them more attractive. If you have blue or green eyes, it's not because you have more of those colors in your irises than other people, but because you simply have less of the other colors. It is the paucity of other pigments that leaves the eyes looking blue or green. Skin color has been changing over a much longer period, at least 60,000 years but it hasn't been a straightforward process. Some people have depigmented, some have repigmented. Some people have altered skin tones a lot in moving to new latitudes, others hardly at all. Indigenous populations in South America, for existence, are lighter skinned than would be expected at the latitudes they inhabit. That is because, in evolutionary terms, they are recent arrivals. They were able to get to the tropics quite quickly and had lots of gear, including some clothing. So, in effect, they thwarted evolution. Rather harder to explain have been the Ko San people of southern Africa. They have always lived under a desert sun and have never migrated any great distance, yet have 50% lighter skin than would be predicted by their environment. It now appears that a genetic mutation for lighter skin was introduced to them sometime in the last 2,000 years by outsiders. But who these mysterious light-skinned outsiders were and how they came to be in southern Africa are unknown. Skin comes in two varieties, with hair and without. Hairless skin is called glabrous, and there isn't much of it. Our only trueless hairless parts are lips, nipples, and genitalia, and the bottoms of our hands and feet. The rest of the body is covered with either conspicuous hair, called terminal hair, as on your head, or vellus hair, which is the downy stuff you find on a child's cheek. We are actually as hairy as our cousins, the apes. It's just that our hair is much wispier and fainter. Although we are estimated to have about five million hairs, nobody really knows. It's just a guess. Hair is unique to mammals. Like the underlying skin, it serves a multitude of purposes. It provides warmth, cushioning, and camouflage, shields the body from ultraviolet light, and allows members of a group to signal each other that they are angry or aroused. But some of these features clearly don't work so well when you are nearly hairless. In all mammals, when they are cold, the muscles around the hair follicles contract in a process that we called, scientifically, getting goosebumps. In furry animals, it adds a useful layer of insulating air, hair, I'm sorry, it adds a useful layer of insulating air between the hair and the skin. But in humans, it has absolutely no physiological benefit and merely reminds us how comparatively bald we are. Uh, the um, goosebumps also make mammalian hair stand up, and that makes animals look bigger and more ferocious, which is why we get goosebumps when we are frightened or are on edge. But of course, that doesn't work very well for humans either. 
Tightly curled hair is the most efficient kind because it increases the thickness between the surface of the hair and the scalp, allowing air to blow through. A separate but no less important reason for the retention of head hair is that it has been a tool of seduction since time immemorial. Every hair on your body has a growth cycle with a growing phase and a resting phase. For facial hair, a cycle is normally completed in four weeks, in case you want to grow a beard. But scalp hair may be with you for as much as six or seven years. A hair in your armpit is likely to last about six months, a leg hair for two months. Removing hair, whether through cutting, shaving, or waxing, has no effect on what happens at the root. We each grow about 25 feet of hair in a lifetime, but because all hair falls out at some point, no single strand can ever get longer than about three feet. Hair grows at about one-third of a millimeter a day, but the rate of hair growth depends on your age and health and even the season of the year. Our hair cycles are staggered, so we don't usually much notice as our hair falls out. I'm going to skip ahead to something very interesting about skin, and that is fingerprints. Fingerprinting as a means of identifying and catching criminals was uh, supposedly was developed by a, um, a detective, a forensic detective in France named Alphonse Bertillon. Now, he gets the credit for developing it, although it actually had been de developed elsewhere, which I'll tell you in a minute. He uh, developed it when he found a single fingerprint on a window frame at 175 Rue du Faubourg Saint Honoré. My French is a little rusty. And used that to identify a murderer. Uh, that system of catching a criminal caused a sensation, not just in France, but around the world. Quickly, fingerprinting became a fundamental tool of police work everywhere. The uniqueness of fingerprints was first established in the West by the 19th century Czech anatomist Jan Perkinje, though in fact the Chinese had made the same discovery more than a thousand years earlier. And for centuries, Japanese potters had identified their wares by pressing a finger into the clay before baking. Charles Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, had suggested using fingerprints to catch criminals years before Bertillon came up with the notion, as did a Scottish missionary in Japan named Henry Folds. Bertillon wasn't even the first to use a fingerprint to catch a murderer. That happened in Argentina 10 years earlier. But it is Bertillon who gets the credit. What evolutionary imperative led us to get whirls on the ends of our fingers? The answer is that nobody knows. Your body is a universe of mystery. A very large part of what happens on and within it happens for reasons that we don't know, very often, no doubt, because there are no reasons. Evolution is an accidental process after all. The idea that all fingerprints are unique is actually a supposition. No one can say for absolute certain that no one else has fingerprints to match yours, all that can be said is no one has yet found two sets of fingerprints 
that precisely match. Far more important than fingerprints um, is another function of our skin, and that is sweating. You may not think it, but sweating is a crucial part of being human. And this is how it's explained. It is plain old unglamorous sweat that has made humans what they are today. Chimpanzees have only about half as many sweat glands as we have, and so can't dissipate heat as quickly as humans can. That's the trick, getting rid of heat. Most quadrupeds, dogs, for example, cool by panting, which is incompatible with sustained running and simultaneous heavy breathing, especially for furry creatures in hot climates. Much better to do as we do and seep watery fluids onto nearly bare skin, which cools the body as it evaporates, turning us into a kind of living air conditioner. The loss of most of our body hair and the gain of our ability to dissipate excess body heat through sweating help to make possible the dramatic enlargement of our most temperature sensitive organ, the brain. Well, that's the end of the uh, ch chapter that I'm going to read today, but I do want to make one last editorial comment. I find it mind-blowing that sweating helps us to have larger brains than any other animal for our size and all the wonderful things that the brains do for us. So every time I sweat, I'm going to feel really, really grateful. Um, thank you for listening, and I hope to see you again soon.